Okay, thanks guys for this. It's the first session of the keynote, right? And the special act thing. I was not involved. <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, joining this session. Um, I'm Dennis Mulder. I work in the Azure Storage product team. Uh, maybe from my accent you hear I'm Dutch. I live here but work for the Azure Storage organizations, organization in a kind of customer partner-facing role, uh, driving the petabytes or ideally the exabytes into Azure Storage. Um, I have a lot of field experience with Azure, so I always mix my sessions a little bit with a few customer stories, which I did for this session as well. The, ho the whole session is about blob storage. So for people that are expecting to hear things about disks or files or things like that, I can talk to that, but that's not the intent of this session. So we can take those things uh, after the session if, if needed. And Azure storage is, in, is so huge that we have to pick. And the sessions are only 45 minutes. So what I have as an agenda is a brief intro into Azure storage, and then we dive into blob storage. I'll talk about a bunch of new features that we recently announced and or released. Um, with specific deep dive into tiering of, uh, of storage, the archival tier, which is currently in public preview, uh, things about security and compliance enhancement, scale and performance improvements, both what we have now and what is coming, um, and then uh, uh, several things in improvements for developers. I'll mix it with a few customer stories and a few short demos. Um, in terms of expectations, what I'd like you to walk out with is understand the basics of blob storage, understand our strategy around tiering of, uh, of blobs, a clear view into all the new features that are on the short-term roadmap, like in the next three to six months, as well as a few peaks into the future. Um, in terms of overview, you may have seen this slide before. The way we look at Azure storage is really the underpinning platform for all of Azure and also all of Microsoft. So Azure Storage powers, for example, all files you store in OneDrive uh, consumer, everything you store in SharePoint Online, any call you make in, X, uh, in, in Skype, any game you play in Xbox, it all in somewhat shape or form hits the Azure Storage platform. We divide it in two uh, ways, right? Infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Under in infrastructure as a service, we have disks and files. Disks underpin a virtual machine. Files is a file share in the cloud, an SMB file share in the cloud. On the path side, more focused on developers is blobs, tables, and queues. And blobs is the main topic of today. Tables and queues are, uh, well, nice things to have. We don't generally talk a lot about those. There's much less innovation going on in that space. Uh, they are mostly done, basically. Um, what's unique about Azure, Azure Storage, is that our storage platform, unlike most of our competitors, is a single piece. It's literally the case that the underlying system, the underlying hardware, does, is agnostic to these five different product lines. So if you store a blob or, or a disk or a, a table, it all are objects at the lower la layer where we arrange things like high availability, durability, and the strong consistency, etc. This whole system today runs at 130 trillion objects at 30 million transactions per second in all 42 regions of, of Azure. And this is growing like exponential, uh, exponentially. By the time I'm done with the session, session, we will have ingested another few petabytes into this platform. That's kind of the way to think about it. So that's a, a, a lot of data. Um, the scale of Azure, you've seen this picture before, right? We go everywhere. Azure Storage is available everywhere. We go in, uh, in as one of the first, of course, um, 36DA, six coming soon. So what is the Blob Storage ser Service? It really is the platform to store and serve unstructured data. Any file, any picture, any video should go here. It's really used for application and web scale type data, but also nowadays a lot for backups and archiving of, of data. Basically all major backup vendors now have support to target Azure Blob Storage. 
And then in a high performance computing space is oft often used for uh, storing uh, in and output uh, data of scenarios like genomics, uh, Internet of Things, etc. We have three types of blobs. Um, block blobs, that's for most object storage scenarios. Uh, a blob comp is comprised of several blocks that can be of any arbitrary size between, f between a couple of bytes and 100 megabytes. And you can upload a blob in parallel by uploading individual blocks and then combining them together as sort of a linked list into the final file. The block blobs platform is also mutable, so you can change the individual blocks and create new blobs out of it. And we're unique there uh, compared to the rest of the object storage space. Where we're unique too is that we have two additional types of blobs for very specific scenarios. So append blobs is, a, uh, is targeted at the scenario where you have multi-writer uh, cases, right? Logging kind of data or IoT streams that only append data to the system. Um, and append blobs are really optimized a specialization of block blobs that is optimized for that scenario. And then the third and last one is page blobs. Page blobs is meant for random read and write scenarios. Event hubs, for example, which is our queuing platform for IoT can um, read, uh, read queue messages multiple times. That is thanks to uh, page blobs that sits under the hood. Page blobs is also what we layered our virtual disk platform on. So the disk platform that powers the VMs is layered on page blobs. All three have APIs and you can leverage those is as part of your uh, session. In this session, I am only covering block blobs though, because that is like 95% of the scenarios. Um, during the session, I'll go through these five core pillars. So we'll talk first about durability and availability and the roadmap that we have in, uh, in that space. Then we talk about security and compliance, manageability, and cost efficiency, scalability, performance, and then uh, I'll talk a little bit about openness and interoperability. So let's get going. Um, if you look into Azure Storage Blobs, it's obviously key for Microsoft to never lose any byte of customer data. And that is built into the core of the architecture of Azure Storage. For example, in terms of strong consistency, we always are read after write um, compatible. Uh, how do you say? Uh, if we write the data, you can immediately read the data back. There are many systems that are not consistent in such a fashion and do asynchronous work. We commit the data immediately synchronously in three replicas. And then we use a mechanism called erasure encoding to store the data in an, a more efficient way. We basically wipe out some of the copies, but by using checksum type technology, we make sure we can still recover from hardware failures under the hood. Then for, from a data integrity perspective, we have uh, integration with principles like MD5 hashes to make sure that the data that we store uh, was the data that was sent and that you can uh, verify that. In the background, we also check for bit rot on, on the hard disks and make sure that we recover from failures using standard CRC checks and mechanisms. From a disaster recovery perspective, uh, Microsoft has by far the most data center regions and that is mainly because of disaster recovery. So in storage, we give you the option to get another copy of your data in the secondary region. So if you host your data in Amsterdam, we replicate the data over to Ireland. If the country floods, not entirely unlikely, then uh, we still will have the data if you opted into this service for disaster recovery uh, cases. We have two flavors there. One is where we just make a copy and it's Microsoft's call to make the data available. With RAGRS, we, you buy the right to kind of access the data in a read-only fashion as well. From a high availability perspective, we have a financially backed service level agreement, uh, which is three nines for um, the mo most durability mechanisms and four nines for the RA GRS uh, one for uh, read scenarios. If we look into storage durability, we now have three different flavors. Um, I talked to them briefly. LRS is three replicas in a single region, is superior to a standard rate, um, and is basically ag protecting against rack and, and uh, disk node uh, failures that happen every day at the scale we run. Disks break, um, and you won't notice that. 
GRS, another copy, at least 300 miles apart. Amsterdam, Dublin, basically two times LRS is kind of the way to think about it. But the Microsoft platform managed uh, synchronization mechanism. And then RAGRS where you can also read from the secondary. And also query how far behind we are, which typically is a up to a couple of minutes. Our goal is to stay under 15 minutes. Uh, and this is a new announcement I'm making, and I'm proud that West Europe is the first, or one of the two first regions to get this. Uh, we are launching Azure Zone redundant storage. So that's another different flavor that most of our competitors already have, where we guarantee that the data is in different buildings. So the three copies today in LRS, for example, are not necessarily in the same build, uh, are often in the same building, not necessarily in different buildings. Here, we make sure that the data is separated across buildings, across different vault zones, with different power and networking uh, segregation, such that we even can guarantee more high availability. So with LRS, ZRS, GRS, and RAGRS, we now have the most widespread uh, options available. Uh, it's in public preview in Q4, also uh, this uh, already in this quarter in several regions, and this is a regional rollout which will go on for the next, I don't know, months to come. And West Europe, Amsterdam is part of this. So with that, let's talk about security and compliancy. Um, I, I'll rush over this, to be honest. Uh, there's a couple of slides, but in the interest of time, uh, I'll, I'll touch on the main topics. We have encryption at rest available. Just a checkbox in the portal, which allows you to uh, tell us to store all the data at rest on the disks in an encrypted form. Um, we have this available today with Microsoft managed keys. So we generate the key, and you have no way to kind of pull out the key. For blobs in preview, we have customer managed keys, and that will, uh, will go live uh, in the next couple of months, uh, where you give us the key. We store the key in Key Vault. We can still serve the data like you're used to. But if, the, if you want to uh, revoke access to the data, it's a matter of pulling the key. And uh, nobody that doesn't have the key can access the data. Encryption and transit. Of course, we've had this since day one. SSL support for the endpoints on Azure Storage. Also, we have this notion of delegated authorization with SaaS tokens, where you can give access to a private blob to an application, for example, or to a user of an application. Uh, you can restrict those to HTTPS. What's new is a capability to actually disable the HTTP endpoint in the portal, and that way forcing your applications and users to use the SSL endpoint. And that is available today. But rarely noticed. That's why I'm highlighting it. Uh, what's also new is uh, a capability to add a firewall on top of Azure Storage. So an often heard complaint is that if you create a storage account, your data is o can only be accessed through a public IP. We now added layered security for storage that allows you to whitelist IP addresses, public IP ranges, or individual IP addresses, as well as limit access to specific virtual networks in Azure Storage, uh, sorry, in Azure Compute. So if you have a bunch of VMs that need to access the storage account, but you don't want the entire world to be able to access the storage account, it's a matter of flipping a few switches here, and that way you, you don't expose your data to the public, uh, <coughs> public internet anymore. And there are a few convenience ways to, uh, to provide some exceptions, like if you want, uh, I don't know, uh, app services to access it, it's a flip of a switch to, to provide that access. Uh, also, another often asked feature, uh, we have deep integration into the Azure portal, into Azure Resource Manager to provision a storage account, and you can offer role-based access on that. With this new capability, we are moving that further down into the what we call the data plane. So the actual blobs in storage will be protected with role-based access control um, based on standard OAuth support um, on the Azure REST API. Uh, so that way you can do role assignments and give people permission to only read blobs in a certain container, for example. Think of NTFS for the cloud, kind of. Uh, this is on the roadmap, and we expect a preview this quarter. 
Um, another key capability we're working on for the archiving scenario and for the financial industry is immutable worm storage. Worm stands for write once, read many. The thinking here is that once the data is written, it cannot be overwritten or deleted based on policies. So think of financial institutes, for example, often have to guarantee that they keep data for seven years or sometimes even 30 years. Um, and there's compliance associated with this, which forces them to, to prove that they never change the data. Well, this platform will basically disable the write, modify, delete operations on our REST API to prevent uh, this from, uh, from happening based on a policy engine that you can set at like the container level. This will be available, and that's where we differentiate with the competition, uh, for all tiers. So hot, cool, and archive. I'll touch on these tiers uh, shortly. And, and then it's going to be compliant with, uh, with various uh, uh, compliancy frameworks. Uh, this will preview in late calendar year 17 and will be released early next year. And so that was secured in compliance. I know I rest over it. Uh, we want to spend a bit more time here in manageability and, and cost efficiency uh, as well as the next section. So an often asked uh, feature is also like if you write a blob and overwrite a blob, there's no way for the service today to prevent you from doing that or there's no way for you to prevent if you give access to a storage explorer and an, uh, an administrator is browsing through the blobs and accidentally deletes something, there's no protection for that, really. It's kind of a one-off, you have access or not, and um, the Azure AD integration will help. But this is another data protection feature that we're going to launch. This is really a soft delete version, so recovery from accidental deletion. Think of it this way, you configure how many versions you want to um, sorry, how, how many days you want to retain a certain overwritten blob. Uh, and, uh, and you can basically turn this off at the level of the, uh, uh, of the, of the service. Um, and then at the blob level, a delete blob will result in a new entry with multiple uh, entries and allows you to kind of undelete. Think of, kind of think of the Windows recycle bin kind of capability on blobs. This will GA uh, early next year. We're also working on true object versioning. So one constraint here, for example, is that every blob that is deleted stays in the same tier of the original file. With object versioning, we'll make it possible to version, uh, to keep more versions, as well as tier individual versions to a lower tier to make it uh, more uh, more affordable, affordable, and will also provide convenience features for your application to actually keep track of the various versions. Here, it's uh, it, it's a little limited in uh, in that front. Uh, my favorite topic: tiered object storage. Uh, we traditionally had one single tier with one single per gigabyte price and a transaction model from a pricing perspective. And we noticed that a lot of people actually want to store all of their massive data in the cloud, but not necessarily access the content regularly. So this is, was a good opportunity for us to look at our business model, our pricing, to offer this in a more attractive way. Data truly has different temperatures, right, over its life cycle. The logging data that you make today is more valuable than the logging data from a year ago from an for an application, for example. And the same is true for data that needs to be retained for um, uh, regulatory uh, compliance, right? The data, the contract from the financial institute from a year ago is, is, has a lower temperature, if you will, than the contract that's still being worked on. So what we introduced uh, last year, April, I think, uh, is the cool tier. And the difference here is not technical at all. The difference really is, this, uh, is the business model, the way we charge this service. Uh, so it runs on the same hardware, it's the same API, the same platform. It's just a flag at the account level uh, and will come at the object level, which says this is a hot or a cool blob. And the difference is the price per gigabyte is higher in hot, but the transaction price is much lower, and in cool it's the other way around. For both tiers, 
uh, time to first byte is measured in the milli milliseconds. It's online data. Uh, we now announced or launched in preview uh, a new tier called the archive tier. Uh, the archive tier is really cold storage for long-term data and it's offline data. Where we differentiate is in the API. So all of the metadata, all of the actual file data, the file name and the file attributes are always kind of in the hot tier. So you can always see your data across all tiers. Uh, but the price for that archival tier is much lower. So again, a consistent API across the entire, uh, entire stack, uh, which allows you to do efficient tiering between those services. So what we also announced with, in conjunction with the archival tier is a way to do blob level tiering. So basically every file you can indicate in which, uh, in which tier it should be. And I'll demonstrate that shortly. We have introduced a new API to set the blob tier called set blob tier, uh, which is immediately acknowledged by the service. So despite the fact that the archival tier is offline, once you make the call for a hot blob to make it archival, it's immediately acknowledged, you immediately get charged the lower price, uh, and asynchronously we will put it into offline storage. Obviously also all the other APIs like the get APIs and the list blob API also provide a field saying in which tier the, the actual blob is. Uh, what we're working on now is an automated lifecycle management uh, uh, engine or policy engine which allows you to say if the file is seven days or older move it automatically for me to, um, uh, to the next tier. Uh, what we have released recently, though, uh, kind of to cover the gap between now and when we have the automated lifecycle management tool, is a data lifecycle management option with logic apps. So that basically allows you to define some rules in, uh, in a logic app, which will basically list the blobs in a certain container, and then based on a rule that you define in logic apps, you, you, um, you basically tier it. Uh, based on whether the condition is met. Um, there's a blob data lifecycle management template in Logic Apps which allows you to do this today. Uh, again, we'll work on an engine that's more native into Azure Storage to do this, uh, to do this for you through configuration instead of a little bit of code that uh, needs to be created. Or code, it's not really code, right? Uh, from an archive storage perspective, the scenarios we see is long-term backup and disaster recovery that I alluded to before, uh, data retention, raw files, right? healthcare, uh, in the healthcare space, there's a lot of demand for this, uh, legal compliance, financial tax records, contracts, things like that is what customers want to keep. Um, and the amount of data that we keep as, a, as an industry or as a society is, is growing like crazy, so platforms like this are instrumental there. So let me go to uh, my first demo and show you a few things on Archival. So I have an account here called Archive Test DM, which is a blob storage account. The type or the kind is important because we only offer tiering and Archival in the blob storage account. So when you create the account, you need to select blob storage and not the standard storage account. This is going to change shortly. I'll touch on that uh, a bit later. If I go into this account, you'll see here I have one container called test. In the test container, I have a bunch of uh, pictures. These are actually uh, my receipts from my travel, my expenses. Um, and you see here that this file apparently is in the cool tier. I have one file in the hot tier, etc. If I click on this hot file, what I can do now is I can change the access tier easily from hot to say archive, click save. Um, and what you'll see shortly is that the file will be tiered to the access, uh, the archive access tier. I hope. Yeah, it's now in the archive tier. It will give a message. Uh, if I tier files back, it will give a message saying, hey, the file is tiered back, which will take some time. This move to archive is basically immediately acknowledged. I have a little bit of code, but I'm not sure uh, of time, so let me rush over that quickly. Highlight, I won't run it. 
So in our .NET library, we have wrapped our REST API calls, which basically allow you to do this programmatically. Think of it this way, right? I have a blob client, I get a container reference, I list all the blobs in the container, I iterate over them, I have some fairly simple logic which looks at like how old is the file, and based on that, I, I put it in the, uh, in the archive tier. It's that easy to move files between tiers. Uh, product programmatically. Again, the logic app scenario is, is maybe easier. Another thing I'd like to highlight, which is a tool from a Dutch company called OD Media, who works in the media industry for various companies. I have a ref case shortly of one of their customers. Uh, they have built a cloud explorer type tool, which allows you to do this in their tool. So here I can change the access tier from this file to archive, for example, um, and also do this in bulk, I think. Right, so this makes it a little bit easier. What's nice about this tool versus our own um, Azure Storage Explorer is that it has the capability to watch a certain folder locally on your system. So once you store the, start the tool, it watches the folder. If new files come in, it will do the automatic parallelized uploads into, uh, into Azure Storage. So it, may, it tries to make handling of large files and uploading of files a little bit easier. I have a link at the end which, uh, uh, to, that, uh, to that tool. Um, so that's for archival. Uh, so this is kind of summarizing my demo, right? So in the portal, you can see the access tier. Um, you can change uh, the access tier in the portal as well. Um, and here's kind of a screenshot what happens when you tier the file back from archive to hot, it will say it's currently rehydrating. It can take a couple of hours maximum. Our goal is to stay under 15 hours for files up to 50 gigabytes. Um, it's very dependent on the, how busy our platform is, how long it will take, basically. And we are working on more advanced features to pay a little extra to jump ahead of the queue, like we have in the Efteling, for example, right? Kind of that capability. Uh, release timeline, so the previews now for blob level tiering, blob storage accounts, it's limited to LRS accounts and it does have support for uh, encryption. If you want to enroll in the preview, there's a link here. There's also a blog post on the Azure.com which uh, highlights this. What we will GA shortly, uh, last quarter, is a new type of account. Currently we have a standard general purpose storage account and a blob account. The blob account is the only one that has this tiering and only supports blobs, so it doesn't support files, disks, tables, queues. What we're going to do is merge these two together into a new general purpose V2 account, which has all of these notions and will support the archival tier and it will support um, blob level tiering, etc. So that notion of that separate blob account is kind of going away over time. Um, and then after GA, we'll work on faster retrieval time, ZRS support, uh, the blob tiering, et cetera, that I alluded to before. One important caveat here is archi the archival tier will not be available in every region from the get-go. It will only be available in typically the major regions. Amsterdam and Dublin are part of this, but uh, for example, many sovereign clowns don't get it initially, like China, France, UK, Germany. Those will all follow later. Uh, so you have to be kind of cautious there. Make sure your data is there where the archival tier is if you want to support archival. Blob level tiering will be available across all the clouds. So from hot to cool will be possible in, in any, any data center region. We have a bunch of storage partners. I'll leave this behind uh, in the slide deck that already integrate with the archival tier. So they have various support for financial scenarios like uh, Archive 360 has that, uh, Hub Store has uh, an entire yeah, concept around archival that is already compliant. Veritas with Enterprise Vault has these capabilities, etc. I encourage you to look at those if you don't want to use our core APIs. So one use case I'd like to highlight from Dutch Filmworks. Dutch Filmworks, the studio, um, company here in the Netherlands that owns a lot of rights for Dutch films and actually also acquires films from the Hollywood studios and does the distribution to iTunes and uh, Netflix, etc. here in the country. 
uh, customer of OD Media, they had a challenge. They had a lot of terabytes of data with, with original film material that they basically kept on shoving around between the new generations of tape. Um, and they wanted a solution to have th that that's more sustainable, cheaper online, which allows collaboration in, 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 in with all the companies that depend on them. And this uh, basically the entire archive of Dutch Filmworks is now running. Their crown jewels are running in in the cloud. There's a nice quote here from Tom around uh, why they uh, they picked this. Uh, another scenario, a little different, that I'd like to highlight is from BP, um, one of the customers I'm deeply involved in. Uh, British, British Petroleum has this notion of an attic. Their issue was they have a lot of data and nobody owns the data. Right? The company is changing continuously, ownership changes, people are like, yeah, well, please keep all the data because we may need it sometime soon. Uh, so what they introduced is a system called the BP Attic, which is an archiving application that's completely self-service. So people actually are forced to do something in order to keep the data, instead of you know IT just keep on storing this, uh, this, this uh, that data. So it now supports about 5.3 million files. Um, project paid itself back in less than six months, and they have way better compliance and retention, better control over their data. They did a piece of a session at Ignite. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, there's much more detail uh, in, the, in a session that I link to at the end. Um, I basically covered this. Uh, so this is a slide that kind of summarizes our path to GA on, uh, on the archive up here. In terms of scalability and performance, um, we did a bunch of improvements here. So traditionally, our file size limit was 200 gigabyte. It's now increased to five terabyte. I would love to know if you uh, see cases where files actually need to be bigger. This was mostly driven by the media industry for 4K and 8K movies that need a larger blob size. We also did some massive write throughput improvements. Think of it this way. If you write a file to Azure Blob, traditionally we were hitting one single disk. And now we're hitting three disks. And even that limit is going away soon by writing it to many disks all at once. Um, there's some architectural work that we did to make this storage platform the fastest cloud storage platform. Uh, we also did a lot of um, improvements for very small blocks. Uh, so small files, the uh, read latency to an indiv individual blob is now basically brought up from a disk to an SSD and even to NVRAM to serve content in a quicker way, especially in multi-reader scenarios where the file, for example, in a high-performance computing scenario read by many nodes, uh, this will go much faster. Traditionally, it was 60 MB per second. It's now over 2 gigabyte per second. Another thing we did uh, recently, uh, and this is an opt-in uh, today, but we'll roll out to everybody. Um, a 500 terabyte was the account limit. We moved that to five petabytes. And the associated throughput of the account, so think of the actual transactions and the uh, bandwidth required to support this uh, has increased accordingly. So 50,000 requests per second, 50 gigabytes per second bandwidth. We intend to move this up very aggressively over the next six months to basically, this project was called Limitless inside the team. The thinking is to remove all caps and make capacity management truly our problem. Um, and a lot of optimization really for high performance computing, big data style scenarios. When this was launched, right, uh, Azure storage uh, clusters were like a couple petabytes. Now they're much bigger and we have many more. Uh, back then they were like, oh, 500 terabytes, never. Nobody will ever reach that. Well, turns out we have a lot of customers that have many petabytes. Uh, so this was an architectural change that we had to make. Under the hood, literally what we do here is we write data to multiple storage clusters now. So we need to s needed to suddenly change our architecture from this kind of siloed cluster mode to write to multiple clusters at the same time. And that allows us also to do a lot of these massive performance improvements that are needed. 
so one interesting case here is uh, Comcast, Comcast Xfinity Home, not offered here, but in the US, um, obviously one of the biggest uh, cable providers. They sell a home video solution. Um, their challenge was a lot of data, right? People buy this easily with their uh, internet subscription. They get a camera, they put that in their house, and the thing films the cats and the dogs. Um, a lot of data. They have over 40,000 cameras running. That's petabytes, uh, continuous petabytes flowing in with very low retention, right? They offer their service. I think it keeps 10 days or something like that. But yeah, in order to build that and support that with a storage platform and have the uh, bandwidth available, et cetera, they needed a cloud. And this was all layered on top of, um, of uh, Azure storage with like 11,000 concurrent uploads, 2.5 petabyte of video, and, and that's growing and overrides itself continuously, of course. Um, interesting uh, use case. Turns out Microsoft's Azure Cloud is very big in these type of scenarios. So video cameras, also body-worn cam body cameras from police agencies. Uh, basically all of the larger vendors run on, uh, on Azure. Uh, data ingestion at scale, one key issue you have is if you have a large archive, how to get it in the cloud. Well, here in the country we are fairly well connected, but to move a petabyte over the wire to Azure takes 12 days on a, on a uh, 10 gigabits per second connection in optimal cases, if you can read that fast from the source. Um, so we, all, we tend to lead with an online conversation, right, make sure that you at least try to do a network approach. The main reason here is that you then only have to read the data once and write it once. If you do an offline scenario, you always have to make a copy, right? Read it and write it, move the device, and then read and write it again. Um, and if you cross borders, there I can tell you a lot of horror stories there. Um, Unfortunately, not everybody has a 10 gig pipe available to do this kind of uploads. And there are various ways to, uh, to overcome that. Uh, if you have petabytes and want to move them, let's, uh, let's talk. Uh, we also support ways to do this over UDP with Aspera and Signet, which are providers that have an optimized protocol to do this massive uh, uploads. And another option um, or distinction kind of, you could do this over the internet, what many companies do or over express route if you're worried about the privacy uh, of the data. Um, we also have a bunch of ecosystem partners. I think I injected the slide. Uh, think of s traditional storage companies, NetApp, EMC, Quantum, uh, Nasuni, et cetera. Companies that have an on-prem storage solution that can tier data to the cloud. That's another way to get the content into the cloud. Of course, Store Simple is one of our own offerings. The key diff disadvantage that I'd like to highlight here is that files are often stored in an opaque form. So what that means is they cut up the files in small pieces, sometimes they dedupe, they encrypt, they do magic with the file, which makes it hard to consume in the cloud. So the other transfer methods are more often used because that makes consumption in the cloud easier. Right? Think of transcoding, think of analytics scenarios, etc. Else you have to make another copy when it gets there through the ecosystem partners, make another copy to native blob storage format. So this is a list of the offerings of some of the partners and we are working on many more partnerships in this space. Uh, with our competition and our friends and our partners. Uh, sometimes it's kind of awkward to see <laughs> who we collaborate with. Uh, I want to highlight one that is NetApp. This is an announcement we did two weeks ago and they did that in, in Vegas last week on their conference. We are going to offer NetApp equipment, so literally physical hardware in Azure for compatibility scenarios with on-prem cases. This is basically NFS, so right, the Network File System as a Service on P NetApp, powered by NetApp, but fully integrated into the Azure portal, into the Azure APIs. Um, this is a very different strategy compared to what NetApp has been offering in the past that Amazon, Google, and our cloud in the virtual appliances. This is literally NetApp equipment on Azure. Again, if you need more details, netapp.com slash Azure, or you can come and ask me. 
From an offline perspective, we know we needed to innovate here. We have had an import-export service for years, uh, which does um, basically disk-based import, right? You send us a 10 terabyte drive with the data, we copy it in. It's available in many regions, requires you to do bit locker and preparation of the disk. Uh, what we announced at Ignite is Azure Data Box. Azure Data Box is a fast and easy rent a device that you can carry, right? It's about 25 kilos and can house about 100 terabyte. You can ship this around, right? There are companies already asking us like, okay, get us 10 and we'll cycle through them to get our petabytes in. Um, it uses standard NAS protocol, so you, it's basically powered up, network connection, you have a share, and you can copy the data there, and magically, after you ship it, it will end up in Azure. Fully safe and secure, tamper-proof, if you don't have the keys, you cannot boot the machine, etc. encryption, um, all certified to make sure that this is all compliant. You can sign up today at aka.ms slash Azure Data Box. It will take a couple months till it is in Europe. We are currently previewing it in the US. As you can imagine, this requires some changes in our data center to actually be able to plug in these devices and, and cycle through them and wipe them, etc. Uh, we tried this out with UFA. UFA is a German studio. Um, and they wanted to move, similar like Dutch Filmworks, their entire archive to the cloud, and they used this device to transfer the hundreds of terabytes of data that they had in their archive and are now using in the cloud to do things like cognitive services, analytics on the video content, uh, subtitling and, and, and things like that to make further use of their, uh, their data. So last topic, open and interoperable. interoperable. Um, of course, we love every developer <laughs> still um, and we have tools that wrap our APIs in basically any language and for any platform. Um, those libraries typically allow you to read and write data in an efficient manner, do massive parallel uploads, uh, consume the data in mobile platforms, etc. We basically wrapped our REST APIs such that they are easily consumable in the language of your choice. What's new is a Go client library, uh, which is coming soon. We didn't cover that language yet. Uh, what's also new is that the data movement library, which is an engine under AC copy, which is a copy tool, RoboCopy for the cloud, uh, <coughs> that's now core CLR compliant. So it can run on any platform that can run .NET. So Mac, Linux, Windows, um, fully cross-platform compliant. In terms of tools, we have our Azure CLI, the command line interface tool, uh, which is now Python based, AC copy, storage explorer to, uh, to manage um, Azure storage and get data there. Uh, what we also did, thanks to that move from uh, core.net to uh, the core CLR, we now have AC copy on Linux. Um, it's still built on .NET, but can also do fast data transfers on, on Linux. Uh, to give further love to the <coughs> Linux ecosystem, uh, we will release shortly, in the next week or two, a Fuse adapter for Linux. So Fuse is an engine inside the Linux kernel which basically allows you to access an arbitrary file system over kind of a bridge, which is called a Fuse adapter, uh, which kind of converts POSIX compliant file operation, file open, file write, file read, to the native Azure blob format. We're uh, releasing this in open source um, and can easily be uh, turned on in Linux so that you can basically do file-based operations against blob storage from a Linux machine. And we, we do various optimizations to make sure that we cache data efficiently, etc. Do parallel things, do smart things to, uh, to access the data. Another um, big announcement at, when was that built, I think, <coughs> is Azure Event Grid. Azure Event Grid is an Azure overarching engine which can handle events happening in the cloud. Think of a new file in a blob storage or a new message in a queue in service bus or something like that. It can fire an event to subscribers, event handlers that you set up. It's a massively scalable pub sub mechanism to do your own event handling 
uh, across all of Azure. And there's a massive effort going on in all Azure services to expose relevant events to Event Grid so that you can consume that in platforms like Azure Functions and Logic Apps. This is currently in preview. It's always demoed with a blob, uh, a new blob in, uh, in storage. Uh <coughs> and yeah, well, that's uh, a nice thing to look at if the standard APIs don't work sufficiently for you. Today we have put blob, put block list, and delete blob integrated. There's more coming. Uh, another big elephant in the room, support for S3 on blob storage. Um, who has that need? Anyone? Oh, nobody. Ah, oh, man, just keep it. Um, so we get a lot of as S3 is Amazon's object storage pro protocol. Um, a protocol that's often adopted by third parties as kind of the standard de facto, the de facto standard object storage uh, platform. Um, we see a need to support this somehow, but we have not decided to build this by ourselves, at least not yet. Um, but we do want to support on-premise object storage vendors and other cloud applications to migrate to Azure, and sometimes the blocker is to convert from the S3 API to the Azure Object Storage API. So we need an option that allows you to do this without code and application changes. Uh, so the key tenets for us is it's partner-based, and we have various options and deployment model and cost models to, uh, to support. And we enforce them to do this in a non-opaque way. Um, so the file is, is native, right? The MP4 file is the MP4 file in blob storage, uh, so that you can consume it easily in, uh, in your applications. So new support for S3 and blob storage, basically what we came up with is an S3 API proxy gateway, which translates an S3 API call into a blob call. Think of it that way, traditional proxy approach. And we have support from five fairly major vendors that have built such a system. So Scality is probably the biggest one. Scality is, the, is in the leader quadrant for on-premise object storage, backed by HP and many other large companies. Minio is another nice one that's open source, which I'll quickly demo. I'm almost, uh, I'm actually almost out of time. Um, so here I have, I have the S AWS command line tool uh, where I can list a storage account in Azure Storage. Let me show you that storage account. <coughs> so there's a storage account here called D Mulder Minio, <coughs> which has two containers. It's a little hard to see, I think. Two containers, test and test two. Um, and here with uh, another call, I can make a tech days container using the AWS CLI against a Minio proxy, which runs here in my Ubuntu Linux VM in, in Docker, um, which kind of bridges this to, uh, to Azure Storage. So if I list again, I see this tech days uh, file. Similarly, I can upload a um, big file, this is a one gig file, to the tech days protocol, and it does a parallelized upload, which goes fairly fast on the Wi-Fi here, of a gigabyte file in an efficient way over the S3 protocol to, uh, to Azure Storage. Let's not wait till it's finished. So that's um, our way to, uh, to support S3 on Azure. So let me summarize and close the session. Um, so in summary, Blob Storage really excels across these these various architectural pillars, right, that we covered, durability, security, scale. Uh, some notable new features, archival tier and blob level tiering are, are key ones. The scale and performance target increases larger storage accounts, better throughput, and you, you can expect much more to come over the next few months. Security, the network access, the firewall on Azure and the various encryption capabilities. And then uh, storage events and our S3 support um, are, are, I think, uh, few key uh, new features. I have a few links here to various more deeper storage sessions. We had like seven, six or seven um, 
cache storage sessions at Ignite. They're all recorded, all available online. I would encourage you if you need more data, de detail around blobs or big data or disks or files or file sync, another service that I didn't get to, um, I encourage you to go here. The Cloudio tool that I showed uh, that does the file folder watching and has the archive support is uh, at this link, cloudio.software, supports the Dutch econ economy. Uh, a nice tool to get started. So thanks for your attention. I'm a few minutes over. Uh, I'll stay around for questions um, if you have any. And uh, enjoy the rest of Tech Days. Thanks.